podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. We have a current goal and it's to get to 100 reviews on the podcast app. If you haven't written a review yet, please do. We've gotten some really wonderful reviews in and we appreciate all of the feedback and the snoozy love in each one. This episode is supported by Rustic Terrain. Tonight, we'll be reading the opening to the 1911 novel titled Me Smith, written by Caroline Lockhart. Lockhart was a journalist, a newspaper owner, and a ranch owner, along with writing novels set in her adopted home of Cody, Montana. The Caroline Lockhart Ranch is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 2018, the National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame inducted her. Me Smith was her first novel. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. One, me Smith. A man on a tired gray horse reined in where a dim cattle trail dropped into a gulch and looked behind him. Nothing was in sight. He half closed his eyes and searched the horizon. No, there was nothing. Just the same old sand and sagebrush, hills, more sand and sagebrush. And then to the west and north, the spur of the Rockies, whose jagged peaks were white with a fresh fall of snow. The wind was chill. He shivered and looked to the eastward. For the last few hours, he had felt snow in the air, and now he could see it in the dim gray mist, still far off, but creeping toward him. For the thousandth time, he wondered where he was. He knew vaguely that he was over the line, that Montana was behind him, but he was riding an unfamiliar range, and the peaks and hills, which are the guideboards of the West, meant nothing to him. So far as he knew, he was the only human being within a hundred miles. His lips drew back in a half grin and exposed a row of upper teeth unusually white and slightly protruding. He was thinking of the meeting with the last person to whom he had spoken within 24 hours. He closed one eye and looked up at the sun. Yes, It was just about the same time yesterday that a dude from the English ranch, a dude in knee breeches and shiny topped riding boots, had galloped confidently toward him. He had dismounted and pretended to be cinching his saddle. When the dude was close enough, Smith had thrown down on him with his gun. Feller, he had said, I guess I'll have to trade horses with you and fall off quick 
for I'm in a kind of hurry. The grin widened as he thought of the dude's surprised eyes and the dude's face as he dropped out of the saddle without a word. Smith had stood his victim with his hands above his head while he pulled the saddle from his horse and threw it upon his own. The dude rode a saddle with a double cinch, and the fact had awakened in the Westerner a kind of interest. He had even felt a certain friendliness for the man he was robbing. Feller, he had asked, do you come from the Manana country? From Chepstow, Monmouth County, Wales, the dude had replied in a shaking voice. Where did you get that double-rigged saddle, then? Texas? The answer had pleased Smith. You ain't losing none of this deal, he had then volunteered. This horse that you just traded for is a looker when he's rested and he can run like hell. You can go your pile on him. Just burn out that lazy S brand and run on your own. You can hold him easy then. I like a feller that rides a double rig saddle in a single rig country. Slong and keep your hands up till I'm out of range. Thank you, the dude had replied feebly. When Smith had ridden for a half a mile, he had turned to look behind him. The dude was still standing with his hands high above his head. I wonder if he's there yet, the man on horseback grinned. He reached in the pocket of his Mackinac coat and took out a handful of sugar. You can travel longer on it nor anything, he muttered. He congratulated himself that he had filled his pocket from the booze clerk's sugar bowl before the mix came. The act was characteristic of him, as was the forethought which had sent him to the door to pick the best saddle horse at the hitching post before the lead began to fly. The man suddenly realized that the mist in the east was denser and spreading. He jabbed the spurs into his horse and sent the jaded animal sliding on its fetlocks down the steep and rocky trail that led into the dry bed of a creek, which in the spring flowed bank high. In the bottom, he pulled his horse to its haunches and leaned from his saddle to look at a footprint in a little patch of smooth sand, no larger than his two hands. He threw his leg over the cantle of the saddle and stepped softly to the ground. Dropping the reins, he looked up and down the gulch. Then he drew his rifle from the scabbard and began to hunt for more tracks. He crept up the gulch to a point where it turned sharply. His stealth became the stealth of the coyote. In spite of the leather soles and exaggerated high heels of the boots he wore, his movements were absolutely noiseless. An Indian of middle age in blue overalls, moccasins, a limp, felt hat coming far down over his braided hair, a gaily striped blanket drawn about his shoulders, stood in an attitude of listening, carelessly holding a cheap, single-barreled shotgun. He had heard the horse sliding down the trail and was waiting for it to appear on the bench above. The Indian saw him the instant he rose from his hiding place 
behind the huge sagebrush. Startled, the man instinctively half raised his gun. The stranger gave the sign of attention, then, touching his breast and lifting his hand slightly, told him in the sign language used by all tribes that his heart was right. He was a friend. The Indian man hesitated and lowered his gun, but did not advance. The stranger then asked him where he would find the nearest house. In swift pantomime, the Indian told him that the nearest house was the home of a full blood, a woman, a fat woman, who lived five miles to the southeast in a log cabin on running water, too, on the Alkali Hill. There was at least an hour and a half of daylight left when Smith struck a wagon road. He looked each way, doubtfully. The woman's house was quite as likely to be to the right as to the left. There was no way of telling. While he hesitated, his horse lifted its ears. Smith also thought he heard voices. Swinging his horse to the right, he rode to the edge of the bench where the road made a steep and sudden drop. At the bottom of the hill, he saw a driver on the spring seat of a roundup wagon urging two lean-necked and narrow-chested horses up the hill. They were smooth-shod, and the weight of the wagon being out of all proportion to their strength, they fell often in their futile struggles. At the side of the road near the top of the hill, the water oozed from an alkali spring, which kept the road perpetually muddy. The horses were straining every nerve and muscle, their eyes bulging and nostrils distended, and still the driver, loud-mouthed and vacuously profane, lashed them mercilessly with the stinging thongs of his leather whip. Smith, from the top of the hill, watched with a sneer on his face. He drives like a Missourian, he muttered. He could have helped the troubled driver, knowing perfectly well what to do, but it would have entailed an effort which he did not care to make. It was nothing to him whether the roundup wagon got up the hill that night or never. Smith thought the driver was alone until he began to back the team to rush the hill once more. Then he heard angry exclamations coming from the rear of the wagon, exclamations which sounded not unlike the buzzing of an enraged bumblebee. He stretched his neck and saw that which suggested an overgrown hoop snake rolling down the hill. At the bottom, a little mud-coated man stood up. The part of his face that was visible above his beard was pale with anger. His brown eyes gleamed behind mud-splashed spectacles. Oscar Tubbs, he demanded, why did you not tell me that you were about to back the wagon? I would have did it if I had known myself that the team were going to go back, replied Tubbs, in the conciliatory tone of one who addresses the man who pays him his wages. The man in spectacles groaned, Three inexcusable errors in one sentence. Oscar Tubbs, you are hopeless. Yep, replied that person resignedly. Nobody never could learn me nothing. Once I knowed, stop, 
We have no time for a reminiscence. Have you any reason to believe that we can get up this hill tonight? No chance did. These buzzard heads had drawed every pound they can pull. But I had some reason to believe that if you don't hiss your hoofs out in that mud hole, you'll bog down. You're up to your pant leg now. Once I knowed, the little man threw out his hand in a restraining gesture, and Tubbs, foiled again, closed his lips and watched his employer stand back on one leg while he pulled the other one out of the mud with a long sucking sound. What for an outfit is that, anyhow? mused Smith, watching the proceedings with some interest. He looks like one of them bug hunters. He's got a pair of shoulders on him like a drink of water, and his legs look like the running gears of a Katie did. So intently were they all engaged in watching the man's struggles that no one observed a girl on a galloping horse until she was almost upon them. She sat her sturdy, spirited pony like a cowboy. Her brown hair, worn in a single braid, was bleached to a lighter shade on top, as if she rode always with bared head. Her eyes were gray, in curious contrast to a tawny skin. She was slight to scrawniness, and one might have thought insufficiently clad for the time of year. Bogged down, partner? She inquired in a friendly voice as she rode up behind and drew rein. I've been in that soap hole myself. Here, catch to my pommel, and I'll snake you out. Smiling dubiously, he gripped the pommel. The pony had sunk to its knees, and as it leapt to free itself, the little man's legs fairly snapped in the air. He said, removing his plaid traveling cap as he dropped on solid ground. That was really quite an adventure. This mud is like grease, said the girl. Once I knowed some mud, began the driver, but the little man, ignoring him, said, We are in a dilemma, miss. Our horses seem unable to pull our wagon up the hill. Night is almost upon us and our next camping spot several miles beyond. This is the worst grade in the country, replied the girl. A team that can haul a load up here can go anywhere. What's the matter with that feller up there? Why don't he help? Pointing to Smith. He has made no offer of assistance. He must be some scissor bill from Missouri. They all act like that when they first come out. Want some Missourians I knowed? Oscar Tubbs, if you attempt to relate another reminiscence while in my employ, I shall make a deduction from your wages. I warn you. I warn you in the presence of this witness. My overwrought nerves can endure no more. Between your inexpiable English and your inopportune reminiscences, I am a nervous wreck. The little man's voice ended on a high C. All right, Doc, suit yourself, replied Tubbs, temporarily subdued. And in heaven's name, I entreat, I implore, do not call me Doc. Sorry I spoke, Cap. The little man threw up both hands in exasperation. Say, mister, said the girl curtly to Tubbs, if you'll take that hundred and seventy pounds of urine off the wagon and get some rocks and block the wheels, I guess my KUs can come to help. As she spoke, she began uncoiling the rawhide riata, which was tied to her saddle. I appreciate the kindness of your intentions, miss, 
but I cannot permit you to put yourself in peril. The little man was watching her preparations with troubled eyes. No peril at all. It's easy. Croppy can pull like the devil. Wait till you see him lay down on the rope. That yap up there at the top of the hill could have done this for you long ago. Here, Wendy, addressing Tubbs, tie this rope to the axe and make a knot that will hold. The girl's words and manner inspired confidence. Interest and relief were in the face of the little man standing at the side of the road. Now, Wendy, hand me the rope. I'll take three turns around my saddle horn, and when I say go, you see that your team get down in their collars. She's a game kid, all right, said Smith to himself at the top of the hill. When the sorrel pony at the head of the team felt the rope grow taut on the saddle horn, it lay down to its work. The grit and muscle of a dozen horses seemed concentrated in the little caves. It pulled until every vein and cord in its body appeared to stand out beneath its skin. It lay down on the rope until its chest almost touched the ground. There was a look of determination that was almost human in its bright, excited eyes as it strained and struggled on the slippery hillside with no word of urging from the girl. She was standing in one stirrup, one hand on the cantle, the other on the pommel, watching everything with keen eyes. She issued orders to Tubbs like a general, telling him when to block the wheels, when to urge the exhausted team to greater efforts, when to relax. Nothing escaped her. She and the little sorrel knew their work. As the man at the roadside watched the gallant little brute struggle, literally inch by inch, up the terrible grade, he felt himself choking with excitement and making inarticulate sounds. At last, the rear wheels of the wagon lurched over the hill and stood on level ground, while the horses, with spreading legs and heaving sides, gasped for breath. Awful tired, ain't you, mister? The girl said dryly of the stranger on the horseback as she recoiled her rope with supple wrist and tied it again to the saddle by the buckskin thongs. Plum worn to a frazzle, Smith replied with cool impudence as he looked her over in much the same manner as he would have eyed a heifer on the range. I was whipped for working when I was a boy, and I've always remembered. It must be quite a ride from the brush back there in Missouri, where you was drug up, he replied shortly. I range is on the sundown slope. They have sheep camps over there, then? Again, the slurring insinuation pricked him. Oh, I can twist a rope and ride a horse fast enough to keep warm. So, was that horse gentled for your grandmother? He eyed her angrily, but checked the reply on his tongue. Say, girl... Can you tell me where I can find that fat engine woman's teepee who lives around here? Oh, you mean my mother? He looked at her with new interest. Does she live in a log cabin on a crick? 
She did, about an hour ago. Is your mother a witter? Looking for witters? I like witters. It happens frequent that witters are sociable inclined, especially if they are hard up, he added insolently. Oh, you're right in the grub line. Her insolence equaled his own. Not yet. And he took from his pocket a thick roll of banknotes. Blood money? Some sheep herders months pay, I guess. You're a good guesser. Not very. You're easy. The girl's dislike for Smith was as unreasoning and violent as was her liking for the excitable little man whom she had helped up the hill and whose wagon was now rumbling close at her horse's heels. They all traveled together in silence until, after a mile and a half on the slope, the road sloped gently down towards a creek shadowed by willows. On the opposite side of the creek were a ranch house, stables, and corrals, the extent of which brought a glint of surprise to Smith's eyes. That's where the widder lives, who might be sociable and kind if she was hard up, said the girl with a sneer which made Smith's fingers itch to choke her. I couldn't coax you to stop, could I? I aims to stay, Smith replied coolly. Sure, it won't cost you nothing. The girl waited for the wagon, and with a change of manner in marked contrast to her impudent attitude toward Smith, invited the little man to spend the night at the ranch. We should not be intruders, he asked doubtfully. You won't feel lonesome, she answered with a laugh. We keep a kind of free hotel. Colonel, I calculate we better lay over here, broke in Tubbs. His employer winced at this new title, but nodded assent. So they all forded the shallow stream and entered the dooryard together. Mother called the girl. One of the heavy plank doors of the long log house opened, and a short woman, large-hipped, in appearance a typical blanket on her shoulders, stood in the doorway. Her thick hair was braided, her fingers adorned with many rings. The wide girdle about her waist was studded with brass nail heads, while gaily beaded moccasins covered her short broad feet. Her eyes were soft and luminous, like an animal's when it is content. But there was a savage passion, too, in their dark